I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. A stretch of the St. Louis River near Fond du Lac has been restored as an important spawning area for native fish. We'll tell you more about that project. Building on its success last year, the Superior Douglas County Chamber has big plans for this year's Small Business Saturday. And what could be the strongest El Nino yet is setting up in the Pacific Ocean. What does that mean for our upcoming winter? We'll ask an expert. These stories and the business news coming up next on Almanac North. Welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. This week's show was recorded on Wednesday afternoon. And now here's Denny with our first guest. All right, Julie, thank you very much and welcome everyone. Well, a damaged stretch of the St. Louis River in far western Duluth is getting a makeover that should improve fish habitat. The area of the river near Chambers Grove Park has been restored and the shoreline of the park uh, returned to a more natural state. Joining us now with more is Nelson French, Lake Superior Great Lakes Supervisor with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. John Lindgren is the St. Louis River Area of Concern Coordinator for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And Jim Philby Williams is Public Administration Director for the City of Duluth. Thank you all for being here with us tonight. Uh, Nelson, the area of the river that's, uh, that was damaged was truly hard hit by that flood of 2012. What's been done so far? Well, the, the site has been, uh, shoreline has been softened, some old infrastructure that was there has been taken out. I really will let John speak in more detail about the site work, but essentially the area has been made more friendly for habitat and eventually more friendly for people as the city gets involved in mm -hmm. doing additional work after the restoration work mm -hmm. is done. So uh, essentially some old infrastructure that was, uh, that was worn out and decrepit and not human friendly has been taken out and more nature-friendly uh, shoreline has been put in. Mm -hmm. John, talk a bit about uh, what some of those changes have been and how they will benefit the fish populations in the river. Yeah, uh, Julie, the, it, it was a great opportunity. Uh, you know, after the flood, the, the city approached uh, the Minnesota DNR with a, with a plan to you know, do some fixes on, on the Chambers Grove Park. And when we saw their, their initial plan, you know, we suggested some opportunities to partner with them and, and, and perhaps uh, add some, some elements that would be of more benefit to, to the habitat in that area and get the, the public up, up closer to the, to the water. You know, and what that entailed was to shift more away from um, you know, a, a, a in increased hardening of that shoreline. For those that are familiar, they know that there was a, a sheet pile and gabion basket along the, along the river and a walkway right, right next to the water. We have some, some photos that are that yeah. we can bring up and maybe you can explain it. I believe that we have a before, during and after sort of a, sort of an image. So what are we seeing here? Yeah, excellent. And, and what this shows is uh, before and this was the condition of the park post storm and then up until the project began and really the city had sort of walked away from maintenance there in, in anticipation of, of, of doing some work along the river. So what we did is uh, we naturalized the shoreline with tow wood and we kind of alleviated the problem, which was a lot of the energy was being focused right along the, uh, the sheet pile wall, and that was causing mm -hmm. the, the sheet pile wall to deteriorate and the walkways mm -hmm. to deteriorate. So th the goal was to uh, place features in the water, uh, rock features that, that directed the current away from, away from the yeah. shoreline, and then offer uh, greater opportunity for the citizens of Duluth and other people that sure. might use that park. To Jim, come. you bring up a good point. Jim, there are dozens of parks in the city of Duluth. Who typically used Chambers Grove? You know, historically, Chambers Grove has been a destination for visitors throughout the region, as well as uh, the neighbors in mm -hmm. the neighboring uh, Fond du Lac neighborhood. 
Um, and you know, our role is really to support our partners in restoring these remarkable natural assets, and then uh, to build upon that foundation uh, by creating uh, world-class park and trail access to those restored resources. And we received a $1 million grant from the State Legacy Fund mm -hmm. to do that work in 2016. Mm -hmm. Now, there has been uh, a beautiful pavilion there with a fireplace. Has that re will that remain? Um, the, uh, the grant will fund uh, accessible, new accessible restrooms, walking trails, and fishing spots. It will uh, fund a new river-themed um, playground. Um, a canoe kayak put in and a renewal uh, of the, uh, the pavilion. pavilion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nelson, this is one of just many um, restoration projects that have been done and are planned in that, the, the river corridor. Um, talk about uh, how much progress has been made in recent years well, since people have really started focusing well, on it. Well, what's, what's been really interesting, <coughs> as uh, viewers may know, uh, in 2010, Congress passed the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which provided, uh, at the time for the first year, $450 million, then sequentially $300 million a year, each year, for priority work in the Great Lakes. Uh, that includes the work that we're doing here in the St. Louis River. The St. Louis River, in 1987, was designated as one of 43 areas of concern. The area of concern is essentially, these are areas and ports in the Great Lakes where historic legacy activities, uh, e the U leaving of contaminants by U.S. Steel and our businesses, or the alteration of habitat yeah. uh, w was very serious, and 130 years of accumulated uh, activity that occurred before environmental regulation. So we've adopted with our partners, both state, federal, and local, a, a significant, bold action plan to restore 1,700 acres of aquatic habitat, of which this Chambers Grove Park stretch of the river was part, and then also, importantly, focus on cleaning up contaminated sediments that have been left through historic activities. I know this community has long been concerned sure. about those issues. Well, we finally have the resources assembled now and the staffing and the funding queuing up to get that work done in the next mm -hmm. five years. John, can you talk to us a little bit about the, the work on the habitat area? What kind of fish might we see an improvement in numbers? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and this part of the estuary, or this part of the river, is uh, in the prime spawning grounds for many migratory fish of Western Lake Superior, and that would include uh, lake sturgeon, mm -hmm. uh, walleye, and uh, long-nosed sucker, and some some key species such as smallmouth bass also use that. And you know what we did was uh, to put these structures in the water, and that will greatly improve you know spawning habitat mm -hmm. for those species. In the past, it seems that boaters have used that stretch. Have fishermen used that area too quite a bit? Well, yeah, and that, that's another good uh, point, Dennis, is that even though the walkway was right next to the river, the habitat was such so that the, the angling there was good for only a small portion of, uh, of the year. And now, uh, with these habitat features in the water, it, it will hold fish for, for longer throughout the year, and also it'll uh, provide opportunities for anglers and other people, park goers, just to come down and get right next to the river and actually put their, their hands in the river, mm -hmm. where at, before you, you, you're right next to the river, but you're looking down, you know, five feet to the water. Mm -hmm. Has the DNR been particularly concerned about the sturgeon population and the sturgeon spawning in that area? Yeah, ever since uh, Western Lake Superior Sanitary District came mm -hmm. online back in 79, uh, both Wisconsin and Minnesota DNR have, have actively mm -hmm. worked to restore uh, fish populations. And, Lake sturgeon was one of those species we actively tried to restore, and, and we've stocked uh, 16 year classes of, of fish ending in 2001, and now we're, we're monitoring the, the sturgeon, the adult sturgeon coming back and trying to, to, to document natural yeah. recruitment. Jim, when could people start using that park again? You know, I, <clears throat> the, uh, the work will be uh, underway all of 2016, um, and so uh, access to the site will be compromised. Um, uh, though that though it won't be closed altogether in 2016. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the the physical changes that the city would like to see um, made there just to enhance it? Well, it's really it's a gateway to a variety of uh, regionally significant outdoor rec experiences. So it's a it will be a gateway to the St. Louis River Water Trail. It will be the a principal trailhead to the St. Uh, Superior Hiking Trail, the Duluth Traverse Mountain Biking Trail. Uh, and it will be restored to its historic status as a magnet for community gatherings, family events, 
Um, this used to be the destination back in the uh, late 1800s for those ferry trips that came mm -hmm. from downtown Duluth uh, to explore the river. Mm -hmm. So this is really a, a nice tie-in to all of the other plans that are going on out in that western quarter then. It really represents in one project all that we hope to accomplish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I suspect there are a lot of people who have never <coughs> been there on the water. I took a boat ride through that area uh, early this past summer. I hadn't been there in 10 or 15 years. It is gorgeous, even though the damage was still prevalent, but mm -hmm. it's still a beautiful stretch. Mm -hmm. And it's going to wind up better than it was before the damage? Absolutely, yes. and there will be a lot more to come. Stay tuned for at least 15 more projects. We'll do that. In the next five years. <laughs> okay. Right. Nelson, John, Jim, thank you all very much for being here. Thank Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, let's dig into our News File archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. There are a lot of mixed feelings among the soldiers on their last day stateside before heading to Saudi Arabia. The reality of deployment is just beginning to sink in. I don't know, I guess it's a kind of a wait and see situation. I'm a little bit apprehensive about where we're going to be or, you know, exactly what the conditions are going to be. I'll see you when I get back. All right, can you hear me back there? The Guard members were given a one-day notice before they had to be at Volk Field. For many, that was barely enough time to even begin worrying about the Middle East crisis. But concern for family members is still obvious. I guess I'd like to say hi to uh, my wife and uh, son. And uh, I'm going to miss them a lot. That's about it. Um, we'll, make, well, we'll make it back. You're in my thoughts, and I'm thinking of you, and I love you. Hi. I'll be home soon. <laughs> For Evening Edition, Joe Thornton, KDLH News. Black Friday sales have generated huge revenues for big box stores in recent years, but smaller firms aren't taking a back seat, judging by the success of Small Business Saturday. For the second year in a row, the Superior Douglas County Chamber of Commerce and the Superior Business Improvement District are teaming up on the promotion, and here to tell us more is Dave Miner, the president of the Superior Douglas County Chamber of Commerce. And welcome back, Dave. Thank you. Good evening to you both. Good Thank to you. see you here. The Small Business Saturday promotion really seemed to pay off last year uh, enough that you want to do it again? It has. You know, we, we, we picked up on this. American Express started it several yes. years ago to really put the push out there for, for people to look to those small businesses, the, the unique shops in their communities. And last year when we started this with the bid, uh, we had over 40 businesses participate. And, it, and again, what was fun about it is a wide variety of businesses, you know, yeah. small, unique shops, the restaurants do tastings, the, you know, some of our, our wine beginnings do, do wine tasting. So it's really an opportunity for people maybe to, to find that shop or a different location that they haven't been in before. Do you know right now how many operations will be open on Small Business Saturday? Well, as far as we know, everybody will be open to the most part. We've got over 30 already signed up for this year. They're, so if somebody's listening tonight, they still have time to give Brittany mm -hmm. a call on Monday Good. or Tuesday and get the materials and, and everything because, we, of course, with social media today, so much of the promotion is, is, on, is on that, so it's easier yeah. to add people and quicker to do so. Mm -hmm. Well, how important is the holiday season to superior small businesses? Uh, well, I, it, I think it's, it's similar to almost anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for most of these businesses, it can account for anywhere between 30 to some businesses, maybe 60% of what their whole year is going to be like. So they really, you know, they, they need this push. They, yeah. you know, it's important for them for the, you know, and for, for people to get out and do it. But I also look at it from the chamber standpoint. It's important for the community to support those small businesses yeah. because those are the businesses that they're out knocking on doors looking for donations and, and needing whether it be cash or a product of some kind. So this is their way to, to show that support and be there when they truly yeah. need them. In fact, I was just going to ask you, Dave, talk to us a little bit about uh, uh, the, the friendliness of uh, the city, the state of, Minnesota, the state of Wisconsin uh, towards superior businesses. What's that relationship like? Well, you know, I've always said, you know, Superior Wisconsin and Twin Ports, it's, it's the friendliness of the people. 
you know, people like to go and shop because, you know, certainly it's easier to, you know, to click online and do it. But when you can go and look at the product or if you know there's a problem and you're going to return it, to, it it's building that relationship with, with an individual business sure. and yourself and, and being able to have that, that comfortableness that it isn't the right thing, I can take it back. And so, you know, I, I, one of the jokes I've heard for years in Wisconsin is, you know, you know, you can, you know, talk to somebody for 30 minutes on the telephone and realize it's a wrong number and still have a good <laughs> conversation. <laughs> you know, so it, it, it's that friendliness that, that I think that our businesses have, that, that they try to do that extra step, go the extra mile, and, and be able to offer the customer something that they can't get somewhere mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. You talked a, a bit about the social media marketing. I, I see you also brought some, we some of your other you know, promotional you know, you know, We've got props and, and we've got posters all, and, all over town. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, as they go out, people can pick up bags, and so they can put their purchases in it. And what we did last year, too, is in each business, you, you can get a passport. And if you go to four different businesses and get it, it, it stamped, then you're going to be in for a drawing for a beautiful basket ah. that each business that's right. participating. So last year, I think the value of the, the, of the package was well over $500. Really? And so again, it's an opportunity for people to get out there and support them, but they get something in return as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do people really seem to change their buying habits to participate in a day like this? Do the businesses report that they get a lot more traffic than they would on a, a typical we did, Saturday? Yes. Yeah, we definitely saw that last year. We saw a lot, you know, we, when we ended up doing a survey, both the participants and the businesses, we saw a lot of positive feedback that people found new places yeah. because again you're encouraging them to go to something different something small so they find things that they haven't yeah. saw before so last year we saw a huge response mm -hmm. how healthy is the superior business community we're seeing right now very strong both uh, in retail and manufacturing across the board uh, Douglas County in, when we look at the sales tax for, for the county loan that's been on a steady increase over the last five to six years so certainly we see a, a broad base of yeah. shopping all across Douglas County because that that's probably your best barometer right there is if, if you see the sales tax going up somebody's spending money mm -hmm. one more time tell us the date this is going to be the uh, Saturday the 28th which is you know a week away so a week and a half or, or excuse me a week from tomorrow so Saturday July 28th right after Thanksgiving you can stay home during Black Friday and and uh, enjoy a nice day out on Saturday. There you go. And if people can't get out to this, are, are some of the local shops doing internet specials or anything like I, that? I believe there are a few of them that, mm -hmm. that you know that are again trying to get into that because it, it it's out there. People are going to shop on the internet, so you have to figure out how do you how you fight that with the big guys and and, and still sure. stay in that game. All right. Well, shop local, shop small. Thank you very much. All we right. appreciate Thank it. You Thank so you so very much. Evil. Appreciate it, Dave. Winter lovers in the region may have been disappointed this week that much of the precipitation falling from the skies was in the form of rain. Others may have been thankful that our region wasn't buried under what would have been a monumental snowfall if the temperatures were a little colder. So this week we turn our attention to the winter forecast to see what Mother Nature has in store. And joining us with that outlook is Michael Stewart, the meteorologist in charge of the National Weather Service office in Duluth. And Michael, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Meteorologists all abuzz about the prospects of a, a strong El Nino. Um, Talk about that and what it is and, and how it could impact our region. Well, what it is, it's an area of much warmer than normal uh, water off the western South American <coughs> coast along the equator. And what that does, that will affect the wind patterns across the northern part of the uh, world. And in this case here, it will create more warm air to flow up into Alaska and down into our area here. So usually when we have a strong El Nino, which this one's going to be, looks like at least strong since 1997, 1998, mm -hmm. we're going to have much above normal temperatures. 
and uh, we have about a 60% chance of above normal temperatures this year. Unfortunately, it's saying that it looks like it may be drier than normal too, which will not help the uh, businesses, as we were talking about small businesses in the mm -hmm. last segment, uh, with uh, travelers coming up from like the Twin Cities, spend money up here in the sure. Northland. Mm -hmm. Now Mike, this week we've been hit by three days of rain, some pretty heavy rain at times. Is this unusual for mid-November? This is somewhat unusual in mid-November to get two to three inches of rain across the area in mid-November. Usually it's two to three inches of snow. Now the rain did turn into snow. It looks like we picked up anywhere from oh, four, uh, three to five inches across uh, mainly areas along the Iron Range mm -hmm. and north mm -hmm. and inland uh, across the Arrowhead. So there is some snow in there, but unfortunately a lot mm -hmm. of the snow was wet and uh, with the sun that we're expecting, uh, it looks like you know it may melt some too. We're not going to have enough for skiing or snowmobiling or any of those winter activities. Yeah. What would it look like right now had we gotten all of that two or three inches of rain in the form of snow? <laughs> if, if we had gotten two, two to three inches of snow, I mean two to three inches of rain in that much snow, it would be like the blizzard of uh, really? Halloween blizzard of 1991. We would have had a lot of snow, probably 20 to 25 inches. Now one thing, cold air does not hold as much moisture as warm air, which we uh, had earlier this week in the 50s. Uh, but still, we would have had a lot of snow with this, mm -hmm. uh, at least a foot of snow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, the United States gets a myriad of weather patterns. Do we find, is, is the U.S. the, the basic uh, uh, recipient of El Nino, or do other countries also get hit by El Nino? Other countries get hit uh, with it also. Where we, uh, especially up here in the northern part of the United States, receive much warmer than normal weather uh, over in Europe, they get hit some really bad storms along the uh, English uh, Peninsula, uh, English Island, mm -hmm. and also in Europe in Western Spain and Western France. They get a lot of really bad storms across there. It's just the way the patterns are that it creates, it's more favorable for stronger storms over in that part I of see. Europe. Mm -hmm. Now in the past couple of winters, we've heard talk of the, the dreaded polar vortex. Does that ever, uh, come together with uh, El Nino and battle it out, and if so, who would win? <laughs> well, in, in this case here, the polar vortex, which has always been an area of cold air, it's mm -hmm. always been up in southern Canada and have been there for every year. In this case here, I think El Nino will uh, allow the cold air that's in that area to not come into this area as often. If you remember last year, we had a long stretch of below uh, zero temperatures. Yep. And uh, in the, this time, as the graph here shows, the winter temperature outlook, as you can see, we're dark uh, red, which is means 60%, and then the red is 50% chance of it actually happening, which is really high. And then you can see dry conditions for the yeah. winter precipitation outlook. Mike, what time of year does El Nino hit its peak? Uh, it usually hits its peak, uh, usually around in January, or February or so. We're starting to get a little, taste of it now because we have been warmer. The first half of November was anywhere from 8 to 10 degrees above normal, which is really unusual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How often does El Nino hit with the kind of strength that we're going to see? This is the strongest since 1997, 1998. Usually you don't get a strong El Nino uh, of this magnitude. It, hap it does not happen that often, maybe every 15, 20 years. Usually when we do receive them, it's weak or moderate, which really doesn't affect us that much. We have a wide range of weather if it's a weak or moderate El Nino. Mm -hmm. Is the severity of it um, connected at all to, to climate change or is that something that's kind of debatable? Uh, it's somewhat debatable. In this case here, it's something that occurs, has happened in the past uh, with research and that previous graph that was on there, that big peak at the right end of the uh, graph was the uh, temper uh, winter of 97, 98, which was the second warmest winter ever recorded here in the Northland since mm -hmm. 1870. Mm -hmm. The Pacific Northwest has been getting battered. Is that part of the El Nino picture? Yes, the El Nino, with a strong El Nino, the West Coast will get some awfully strong storms like what happened on Wednesday. Uh, they had winds of 70, 80, 90 miles an hour in the state of Washington. This will help to at least give some rain to California, Oregon, and Washington. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna end the drought. 
but it's really going to help them. Oh, that's mm -hmm. interesting. And that can help all of us with uh, lower prices. And <laughs> yes, it will help us with the agriculture uh, since we've been affected by the drought with the higher uh, cost of food. Mm -hmm. Well, keep your eye on the weather and uh, we'll be in touch. <laughs> so will we. So, <laughs> thanks, Mike. Thanks so much, Thank Michael. you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Well, it's time for a look at the week's business news now from Business North. It has been a week of bad economic news throughout the Northland. Cliffs Natural Resources said Tuesday it will temporarily idle iron ore pellet production at North Shore Mining in Silver Bay. The idling will occur by December 1st, and Cliffs said customers' orders will be filled from current pellet inventory. North Shore will join Magnetation's Kiwatan plant, Masabi Nugget in Hoyt Lakes, United Taconite in Eveleth, and U.S. Steel's Kiwatan facility, which also have been idled due to low steel demand and high steel imports. Verso Corporation, which owns pulp and paper manufacturing facilities in West Duluth, revealed this week there is substantial doubt about the parent company's ability to remain in business without restructuring its debt. Verso also said the Duluth pulp and paper mill, acquired through the January merger with NewPage, might be sold again. One of the country's newer and more efficient mills, the Duluth plant has had three other owners in its 28-year history. Verso lost $111 million in the third quarter and has lost $293 million so far this year. Enbridge Energy also is in a cost-cutting mode. The partnership will trim 500 jobs and leave another 100 positions unfilled. The reduction will occur across its workforce in the United States and Canada. A company spokesperson linked the cost-cutting effort to a reduction in the price of petroleum, which Enbridge transports through its international network of pipelines. It is estimated that more than 35,000 petroleum workers have lost their jobs this year. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. If you have a comment about our show, now is the time to call. Dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdse.org. Of course, you can also go to the WDSE website for updates on your favorite programs, news about the station, events, or to become a supporting member online. And, Denny, this is our last show for a couple of weeks. There's no program next week right. due to the Thanksgiving holiday. And the following week, we're off during the WDSC membership drive. And we do appreciate your pledges. Mm -hmm. So take advantage of that. Uh, you can't watch us, but you can watch a lot of great other shows and be sure to call. There you go. All right. And be sure to join us again for our next show on Friday, December 11th. For Denny and the crew here at Almanac North, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend.